Well, our sermon text, as I've already told you, is Exodus 20, verse 13, very brief. You shall not murder. Well, I've already told you, we've been looking at God's love for us, how it is infinite and how it is everlasting. How knowing from eternity that we would fall into sin and become liable to hell, now that's not a very popular word today, but I hope we, we all get the impact. We all were born into this world, actually conceived, and on our way to hell because of Adam's sin. And, you know, the thing is, I, I do think um, sometimes we forget. I was, I was thinking about, as I walked in here this morning, I saw a dove out there, you know, and I thought about, you know, that dove is a beautiful creature, um, very gentle. It's often a symbol of peace and a symbol of the Holy Spirit because of its gentleness. Uh, I thought that dove is going to die. You know, it's going to die. And the reason it's going to die, I thought, first of all, is because of Adam's sin. And that's true. But then I thought, you know what? Adam's sin was imputed to me. And I'm the one who is equally responsible with Adam for the death of that animal. That, that's something I don't think we ever really personalize. When that sin is imputed to us, we become guilty of bringing that curse on the creation. And we know that we have sinned many, many times, and we deserve hell. But again, the Father, knowing this, purpose to send his son into the world for our reconciliation, for our forgiveness, that he might cleanse us, wash us in the Lord Jesus Christ, impute his righteousness to us, and then adopt us into his family. And that's the glorious gospel. But the second part of it is also a part of the gospel that we don't want to forget. His purpose also was to free us from the corruption of that sin, that desire to hurt, to hate, to hate God and to hate our neighbor, to make us more like Jesus. That was his purpose, to make us like him. So we've been looking at uh, seeing that that is the purpose. We've been looking at Jesus and what he was like. And we've seen that from the first four commandments that his, um, his life was all about loving and pleasing his father, devoting himself to him making him known to others in the way that he lived and the things that he said. We know that Jesus did everything perfectly. So his life was a life of pure devotion to his heavenly Father. But we also know he loved his neighbor. Now, loving God is the most important thing, and it's foundational to everything else. If we don't love God, we're not going to be able to love our neighbor. But we need to realize, as John tells us in 1 John 4, that we really can't love God and hate our brother at the same time. And the same thing is true. We can't love God and hate even those who aren't our brothers, those who are made in the image of God at the same time, because they do, in certain ways, bear his image. And so the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, because they're made in the image of God. And we are to love them in the way that Jesus loved them. Well, we've been looking then at the, the second, you know, part of the commandments, the, the, the last six, so to speak. We've already looked at the, uh, the sixth, or excuse me, the fifth commandment. We've seen that Jesus loved his neighbor by respecting their authority. He honored his parents. He honored church leaders. He even honored the Roman government. And what that means is he gave weight to what they had to say. He recognized they had authority. And so he honored that authority. And the reason he did was because he knew his father had ordained those authorities for his good. That's why we honor authority. Okay? Now this morning, we see that Jesus also uh, protected the lives of those who are around him as the father requires in the sixth commandment. So that's what we want to focus on this morning is the sixth commandment. Well, first of all, let's clear up a misunderstanding. I think I've already um, talked about this just a little bit, about what you shall not murder actually means. Now, <laughs> I don't know what version of the Bible you're looking at, but I want you to notice, if you're using the NASB, that God does not say here, you shall not kill, although he does say that in the King James Version. 
is a mistranslation, really, or at least of, the, of the, uh, the meaning of the particular Hebrew word. The meaning is, you shall not murder. And I bring that up because there is a difference. Okay? Killing is the taking of life justly. Murder is the taking of life unjustly. Now, in both cases, the person is killed. I mean, we understand that. But in one case, it's warranted. In the other case, it isn't. So though some may disagree, there are times when taking a life is the right thing to do. Now, we saw last week that God has given the magistrate, he's given the government, our government, uh, at the various levels, the power of the sword, which means he's authorized them to punish crimes, even to execute those who commit certain crimes. And let me just give you an example, murder. Okay, we've already looked at murder. Um, in Leviticus 24, 17, we read this. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. Now, some would argue that that is, you know, under the old covenant theocracy and therefore doesn't apply to us um, anymore. But... We need to realize we just saw in Genesis before the old covenant theocracy and the ceremonial law and everything going on there that God gave that commandment to Noah when he got off the ark. This is a universal, um, really, uh, penalty for the taking of life. Now, in order for that to take place, there does need to be at least two or three witnesses who see that crime, we read in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Of course, the danger of that is if you have a vendetta against someone, you can very easily get them killed. All you have to do is testify against them. But even with two or three, you can be, you know, you can still have a miscarriage of justice, which is why the Lord also warns that if these witnesses come and they're proven to be false witnesses, that whatever it is that they're trying to do to the person they're witnessing against, that will be done to them. Okay, so God tells us that there are crimes, and there are several other crimes that are actually capital crimes, that warrant execution in this life. Now, we know that in God's court, uh, that one day we're going to have to stand before, every sin is a capital offense. I mean, look at um, the list that Paul gives at the end of, of Romans 1. You know, that, that we know that those who do these things are worthy of death, okay? Every sin is worthy of death, which is why we should be thankful for Jesus, because he has taken that penalty on himself. And even though we may still commit crimes that deserve death, Jesus already died that death for us. It doesn't give us a license to sin, we know, but it does make us thankful for when we do fall into sin that he has already forgiven us. Now, governments may also use this authority, the power of the sword, to send an army against those who threaten the lives of their citizens. Okay? That's what we call a just war, such as the war, and again, maybe there are some who disagree with me. If you do, forgive me. But I do believe that Israel is prosecuting currently a just war against Hamas and Hezbollah, or maybe that one hasn't fully begun yet, because of their attack and their slaughter of so many innocents. I, I think Israel is justified to go in there and to find those people responsible and to bring them to justice. Okay? Now, because that, if you agree with me or if you don't, you realize that there are situations where there are just wars, such as when we got involved in World War II and tried to stop Hitler, right? That because it's a just war, we may, as Christians, fight in that war. We become servants of the states, and even though we're the ones taking their lives, we're authorized by the government to do it who has the power of the sword, now, I believe government may also raise and maintain a police force that is authorized to use lethal force. That's the reason why they carry guns with them. And I think that they may not only protect their own lives, but they may also protect the lives of their citizens by executing those criminals who are seeking to harm them. Now, again, because that is a lawful use of that authority that God has given to the government, 
we may serve in that capacity. Now, what about ourselves personally? May we ever kill someone? We have the ability to do it, but may we? Well, there are times when we as private citizens would be justified in also in taking another's life. Now, the Bible does say if someone slaps us on the cheek, we're to turn the other cheek, which means that we are to prepare ourselves for another blow, another insult, but I think that means a non-lethal blow. If they come at us with a deadly weapon intending to take our life unjustly or to murder us, we may defend ourselves, even to the point of killing that individual to stop them from taking our lives. Now, the point behind this is this, that this commandment that God gives to us does not forbid the, the just taking of life, but he does the unjust taking of life, okay? Such as, you know, government can use the power of the sword in an unjust way when it uses its power, its military or its police to tyrannize its own people. You know, I'm trying to think of some examples, the KJB in Russia, or maybe the Gestapo in Hitler's Germany. You know, these were used in a very ungodly way to keep everybody under control. He did a lot of other things as well that are just ungodly. Or when a country, you know, prosecutes an unjust war against another country. Perhaps when Kuwait was swallowed up, you know, by the uh, neighboring country. Or, um, you know, again, we think of differing, differing things. Well, let me give you a couple of current examples. When Russia is prosecuting war against the Ukraine. And I think from our perspective, because Ukraine is, is free and democratic, it's its own country, that what Russia is doing is tyrannizing. It's using its power to take Ukraine because, as I understand it, Putin wants to bring the Soviet Union back together. Or what Hamas is doing, or Hezbollah, what they're doing to Israel, what they're doing is very unjust. They are, again, prosecuting an unjust war. They are killing innocent people. Or, of course, when government executes people who are innocent. And, and that's what you know, this, these other things are all about. If they use their police or their secret police to murder people in order to maintain power. Um, we're not to take personally, okay, that's what government's not to do, but we are not personally to take a life in anger or as an act of revenge. Uh, we are prohibited from accidentally taking lives, although, you know, if it's an accident, it's something we really can't perhaps um, s stop. But we need to be careful that we don't run into a situation where something like that might happen. Uh, for instance, if, if, and hopefully this isn't the case with any of us, but I'm just thinking of examples where this commandment would be broken. We're not to drive under the influence of any substance that would impair our safety or the safety of others. We're not to be careless with a loaded firearm. You know, if you haven't had firearm training, you might just kind of wave a gun around or a rifle and sometimes end up pointing at people. Uh, if you get that ingrained in your mind um, well enough, you'll be like my friend uh, Brian, who he had a, a loaded revolver, excuse me, an unloaded revolver with the cylinder out. No possibility in the world that that gun could ever fire. You know, if you know anything about revolvers, you know, you've got to have bullets in the, in the chambers, you've got to have it closed, and so forth. But he still didn't want it pointed at him, okay? It, it would still be wrong because it could accidentally go off. Well, that gun wouldn't, but if you get in the habit of doing that, you might easily do that. Uh, we can break this commandment by being negligent to watch children who are under our care, you know, if we don't keep them safe, you know? Now, if we kill somebody accidentally or, yeah, that's less serious than premeditated murder, but it's still the unjust taking of life. And it, it still, in, in Scripture, requires the death penalty under most circumstances. Under certain circumstances, it may not. Now, this commandment also means that we are not to take our own lives, okay? We're not to murder ourselves. Suicide is self-murder nor are we to assist in the murder of another, not even when they're terminal and in pain. You know, you hear about these angels of mercy or mercy killing. Um, we, we don't take the life of anyone. You know, the, the reason why we have hospice 
is to allow people who are terminally ill to die with dignity and in comforts and where possible, perhaps even in their own homes. They, they manage the pain so it's not unbearable. But they don't, they're not to put them out of their misery, you know. God takes the life when it's time. Now again, let me ask the question, with, with all these violations, all these things that, that constitute murder, can you imagine Jesus doing any of those things? Taking life unjustly? Well, if you can't, then you realize neither can we. Okay, we, we need to protect life. But as I've said, there's many other applications of this commandment and reminding us again what the psalmist writes is true in Psalm 119, verse 96. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. The Ten Commandments are not the only things we need to do. They are in a sense with regard to obey, obedience. Okay. Um, how would I put it? Uh, that's what the Pharisees' mistake was. They thought just the bare words, if I just keep the bare words, that's enough. But there's more. The commandment is, is broad. Everything that we are called to do, everything that is a, an act of love and mercy and grace, it's all included in these commandments. For example, we are, I think we've already seen, uh, for everything the commandment prohibits, the opposite behavior is enjoined or commanded. Okay, we're not to take uh, life unjustly. We're not to murder. Instead, we are to protect life, and, and that application is quite, quite broad. Now, we need to protect our own lives, as we've already seen, you know, self-defense, even to the point of taking life. But we are also to protect others, okay? We are to protect our children. We are to protect our parents, especially when they get old and can't protect themselves. We are to protect our families more broadly. And let me just say, men, you know, the responsibility for this pretty much falls on our shoulders, okay? We're, we're the providers. We protect against poverty and the, the lack of things that, that we need to sustain us. But we also need to be able to defend and protect our families. Remember what Jesus did when the soldiers came out to arrest him? How he went out in, in front of his disciples and protected them. We read in John 18, verses 5 through 8, where Jesus says, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he asked, uh, again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me... Let these go their way. Jesus, as the good shepherd, was protecting his sheep. Uh, you know, fathers, husbands, as, as heads of family, you need to protect your sheep. And for those who don't have a head, you become the head. You need to protect your children and your household. Um, so, and, and really, we need, again, to think about this more broadly, we do need to protect others. Now, Thankfully, God has ordained government in our country. We don't have anarchy. We don't have the, you know, the law of the jungle. Uh, people can't just come and kill us. and Well, they can, I suppose, but not as easily uh, as they might otherwise. Because uh, this government that we have maintains a police and a fire department to protect our lives and our property. Uh, God has also, throughout history, providentially ordained the establishment of hospitals right, hospitals, and he's given medical knowledge uh, to doctors and nurses, skills, to also to be able to protect and preserve life. Now, we need to be thankful for that because they're doing most of the work for us, okay? But again, there are things we may have to do that affect us more personally. And then the thought occurred to me as well, which I can hardly escape, especially in light of the most recent presidential debates, where each candidate apparently agrees with abortion under certain circumstances. And Biden, we know, quite, quite you know, it's far left. But Trump even, you know, the idea of abortion. So what do we do? How do we, you know, what do we do about those our government refuse, refuses to protect? What are we supposed to do? And again, the lives of the most helpless, the unborn. 
Well, biblically, we also need to protect them. But how do we do this? How can we protect them? Well, we don't do it by, by injuring, threatening, murdering doctors and firebombing abortion clinics. We use the lawful means that God has given to us. Support pro-life pregnancy centers. Do lawful protesting, petitioning, lobbying, voting, uh, counseling those we know that may be seeking an abortion, maybe in front of an abortion clinic. That's, uh, I mean, how do you run into people like this? It may be difficult. Or maybe working in the uh, pro-life uh, you know, pregnancy centers. But I think the most important way we can protect life in, the, you know, in this area is by praying and by evangelizing. Because we need to realize as long as there are those who want to have abortions, they're going to find a way to have them. And there's going to be people who are willing to offer them those services. So we really need to pray and do the work of the kingdom so that men's hearts change. Now we can further protect life by giving food to the hungry and clothing to the naked, particularly to fellow believers. Think of how many times Jesus fed his people. He fed the hungry. Now we know he did it to prove who he was, but he could have just as easily performed a miracle like making a fruitless tree grow up in the middle of the ground instantly to, to its full maturity. And that would prove it. But the miracles that Jesus did always benefited those who were around him. And those, you know, those miracles where he breaks the bread and the fish and he feeds 5,000. You know, he's, he's feeding them. He's meeting their needs. He saw that they were hungry and he had compassion on them. The sheep and goat judgment reminds us that Jesus will be looking at us on that day to see if we have helped our brethren in the same way. Now, the Bible, um, we're told in Scripture that we're also to be concerned for unbelievers. Now, we need to be careful because, you know, there's a lot of needy people around us, and oftentimes, um, I hate to say it, but the people we see on the street begging money, panhandling, and that type of thing, very often they're doing that because they don't want to work, okay? And, and we need to be careful we don't enable them, you know, to allow them to continue not to work, but just to ask for handouts. By the way, we need to be careful we don't do that for believers either because that same thing can happen. There are all too many in our society who would be willing to take everything that we have, everything we're willing to offer them just so they don't have to work. But let's not forget what the Apostle Paul says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such pervert persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. You know, I think you'd be surprised when people don't have what they need. If they get hungry... <laughs> Or if they see their, their, you know, maybe their shelter, their housing threatened, how they get busy and they get to work. And they do what they need to, to take care of their needs. But if somebody else is doing that for them, they don't have any reason to. It's a lot easier to let somebody else take the responsibility. But the Lord says we need to take the responsibility for our own livelihood if we're individuals. And of course, if we're uh, husbands, if we're fathers, we need to take that responsibility for our family. We are to help those who are in real need, those who can't help themselves. Again, Paul says in Galatians 6.10, so then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. And we need to remember at the same time what Jesus said to his disciples, for you always have the poor with you. We're not going to be able to end poverty, but we likely will be able to help somebody, you know, um, ease their, their pain, meet their needs. Now, again, for better or worse, our government has established taxpayer-funded programs for this purpose. I mean, you know that every time you, you know, it's tax time, right? You realize you're the taxpayer. I'm the taxpayer. We're already paying 
you know, for this to take place. And as we know, there's a good argument for the government not doing it, but we ought to do it. But remember, too, at the same time, there are other countries where there are no such government programs, where people are still hungry, and they're exposed, and they need our help. So one of the ways we can fulfill this particular mandate is by supporting one of the many organizations that have been established, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> preferably a Christian one, to meet those needs, such as come over and help, or some other one that, that maybe you would prefer. So this commandment tells us that we need to protect life, again, by feeding the hungry and clothing the naked taking care of, of the needs that people have, that if they're not met, they will perish. Now, this commandment also tells us we need to be careful with our words. Like I said, this commandment is broad. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verse 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, <clears throat> so that it will give grace to those who hear. Have you ever heard the expression, the pen is mightier than the sword? We know that words are very powerful. People have written books that have brought about revolutions and have caused the death of thousands and thousands of people, millions of people, right? Uh, words are very powerful, but even our words can be very powerful. We need to make sure we use them properly, okay? Because if we say something to someone that um, is perhaps critical, uh, perhaps threatening, uh, we can cause them stress. You know, be, try being under criticism for, you know, a long period of time. I, I know what that's like. Uh, uh, my, my first years here at the church, it's very, very difficult to, to function under that kind of circumstance, and it, it, it wears you out. It, it, I think it can actually kill you. We need to make sure we don't do that. Paul tells us through the, through the Spirit of Christ that we need to build each other up with our words, okay? So be careful what you say to one another. Also, we need to be careful what we encourage other people to do or not to do. We want to make sure that we would never encourage them to eat or drink anything that would be harmful or to encourage them to eat too much or to eat something that is against their conscience. You know, a person, if you know, the Bible says whatever we do, <clears throat> that is not of faith, is sin. Paul writes in Romans 14, verses 21 through 23, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. So we communicate in a variety of ways. We can encourage people to say, hey, you, know, you shouldn't have this scruple. Go ahead and eat this or, or drink this. Or even from our example, people can be encouraged to do things perhaps against their conscience. Now, we're talking about matters of liberty, Christian liberty. Maybe you have the faith you can drink wine, but your brother doesn't. So don't drink wine in front of them and perhaps entice them into doing something they're not convinced that they can do. Uh, certainly, we don't want to encourage people into activities that are dangerous or abusive. You know, I was thinking about this too. Uh, some of us might enjoy watching a good boxing match or, uh, God forbid, maybe an MA, MMA match, you know, mixed martial arts where they, <laughs> they just beat each other bloody. But we really need to think about whether a sport where the object is to beat your opponent into an unconscious state, whether that really honors the Sixth Commandment. You know, should we encourage people to engage in those things? And really, we need to think about this too. Should we enjoy watching it? <laughs> you know, it, it, it really is contrary to the commandment. And I suppose there's a lot of contact sports that this might actually apply to. And activities that are just plain dangerous. You know, plain dangerous to put your life at risk. Now, we shouldn't use our words like that to encourage people to do things harmful. Rather, we should use our words, as I've said, already to build them up, but also to share the gospel with unbelievers, to save them from that which threatens them the most, which is hell. 
See, that's how we can use our words. We can build people up. We can maybe even give them some good nutritional advice so they don't systematically you know, hurt themselves by, by what it is they're eating, if, if we can help them in that way. But certainly not encouraging them to do things that are bad. Rather, use our words to lead them to Christ and to honor Him because ultimately that is the way that they are going to take care of the lives of others, their own lives as well. And it will save them from the ultimate danger. Now finally, this commandment tells us that we need to watch over our words. Uh, we already t looked at that. Desires and our thoughts. I'm thinking here desires. Okay? We need to control our anger. Jesus told us earlier in our scripture reading that we can be angry enough to want to murder somebody in our hearts. And that kind of murder or that kind of desire breaks the sixth commandment. Now, it's not the kind of murder that warrants the death penalty, but it still is a violation of God's commandment to love. Now, maybe R.C. will correct me uh, this Wednesday, but uh, I do believe anger is a decision. You know, people can tempt us to get angry, but they can't make us angry. Anger is, is really our response to whatever it is that's, that we don't like, okay? Uh, God has given us by His Holy Spirit the ability to control this, and that's what we are called to do. Nor are we in our minds to indulge in the idea of hurting other people, fantasizing about, again, how we're going to seek our revenge, what we'd like to do to them. That also breaks the commandment. Rather, we need to desire their well-being, okay? We need to think good thoughts about them and how we can help them and serve them and maybe overcome what it is they're doing that was an offense in the first place, not the least of which, again, if they don't know Christ, sharing Christ with them. And then finally, what we do for others, we also need to do for ourselves. We need to make sure we avoid dangerous situations, unless, of course, in our Lord's service, it's unavoidable. You know, missionaries go to countries where it may be illegal to proclaim the gospel and they're putting their lives at risk. Are they breaking the commandment? No, because God has given us the commandment to go and share the gospel. And he also tells us, though um, maybe you don't often think of it in these terms, but martyrdom, being killed for doing the work of the Lord, is a great honor and blessing uh, in his kingdom. And there are those who are willing to make that, you know, pay that price, and really we need to be willing to pay that price. So was it safe for Jesus to do the work he was doing? <laughs> I mean, he was hated, he was almost stoned on several occasions, and Jesus eventually went to the cross. No, it's not always going to be safe to do what God calls us to do when it's, we can't avoid the danger. We, we, you know, we need to make ourselves liable to it, but as, as much as we can avoid it, you know, don't go into a, maybe a, a biker's uh, bar and, and begin telling them they're all in sin, they need to repent. Maybe that's not the best idea, right? Be wise in how you share the gospel with, with others. Um, we need to make sure that we avoid being around those who abuse us verbally, you know, who, who criticize us, you know, and we need to think about how to help them, but we just need to make sure that we don't subject ourselves to it continuously because it can, it can really affect us physically and, and emotionally. Uh, or those who might encourage us to eat or drink things that are dangerous. You know, we don't want to be around that or to become involved in dangerous activities. Uh, we need to guard ourselves from eating and drinking too much. You know, what the Bible calls gluttony. You know, we call that the socially acceptable sin. But gluttony is, is dangerous. It, it hurts us. It, it, um, you know, it, it can take our life prematurely. Um, and of course, from thinking of thoughts of harming ourselves. And we need to make sure that we're trusting in Christ that we're being faithful in our worship, that we're putting Him first in our lives, that we know that we are safe from judgment. You know, if we keep ourselves physically safe our entire lives, but we don't watch over our souls, what have we really gained? The sixth commandment is really all about protecting life, okay? Our lives as well as the lives of others. And this is really just a part of what it means to love others as we love ourselves. So may the Lord give us grace. There's, I'm sure the commandment is much broader than this, but 
Hopefully, we've been reminded of some of these things, and by God's grace, um, that we'll be able to do that. Let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer as we also prepare to come to the table this morning.